Hey everyone, Dr. Tim and Hillary here for another session of Dr. Tim's Aquatics Podcast. We just got back from uh, Reefa Palooza. How are you doing today, Hillary? I am doing good. Having a little bit of uh, Reefa Palooza withdrawal. <laughs> it's good to be back in the show circuit. Lots saw lots of uh, people and uh, good good turnout. People want to get out and uh, talk about fish, corals, and their tanks. So. It was it was a quick but fun weekend. Yes. So this is going to be our Q and A podcast. Got a bunch of questions. I think we I think you have a bunch of questions that we got from the show. So we'll go over some of those as well. And I'll say this now, and we'll say it again at the end. If you have questions, send us an email, send us a message on Facebook or on Instagram. We're happy to answer any questions that you guys might have. Yep. Yeah. I think we've got so many, it's going to have to be a two-parter. Yeah, I think so. We got a lot today. Yep. Complicated ones, very complex, multi-part questions. All right. Well, we'll put our heads together and see what we can come up with. Sounds good. All right. All right. So I'll let you start. All right. So as always, we get a lot of one and only questions and that's our first one. So I purchased a bottle of one and only to use in cycling two tanks, but I realized once I got home that I'm supposed to add the whole bottle just in one tank. Is it okay if I split the bottle between two tanks to cycle them? Uh, sure, it's fine to split the bottle. What, why we say on the back, add the whole bottle is because one and only sitting on your shelf is not doing you any good. Uh, there's not really any reason to save it. So with the smallest size, the two ounce does 30 gallons. Um, if you, but it's non-toxic. You can add it anytime and you can't overdose. So if you're cycling a 10 or a 20 or even a five gallon tank, there's really no reason to save it. It doesn't get, unlike wine, it doesn't get better in the bottle. So shake it up and pour the whole thing in. But if you're going to do two tanks, sure, you can split it. Just realize you do need to shake it because it settles pretty fast. So shake, pour in one tank, and then shake again and pour it in the other, or you know save some for when you get that tank ready. But um, it's it's all a numbers game in terms of how much bacteria you you quote need. If you're especially if you're doing a fishless cycling where you're controlling the amount of ammonia. So if you add a little less bacteria. Okay, maybe it's going to take just a little longer to cycle or cut back on the ammonia drops. You know, you don't have to add four, as we say, four drops uh, per gallon. That's for a lot of fish. If you're cycling a beta tank or a small tank where you're only going to add a couple of fish, it's perfectly fine to use one drop per gallon because that, that translates into a lot of ammonia from several fish. So one or two fish, one drop is fine. You don't have to, you know, stick directly to the formula. Good to know. Good to know. You know, I think I think when they sent this question, I think it was actually a 10 gallon and a 20 gallon tank. So they were good to go as long as they shook the bottle in between. Right. Because was. sometimes why why I bring that up is sometimes people are like, okay, I gotta save it. I don't want to dump it, you know, dump it all in and the two ounce bottle isn't very big. So they're kind of pouring it slowly in there and they forget to shake it. So the first tank gets no bacteria because they pour in a clear liquid. So you definitely have to shake it uh, and then pour it in. Sounds good. Okay, question number two. This is after two months of trying to cycle my tank, my ammonia is still at four. My nitrates and my nitrates are both at zero. Can you help me? Do you know what's going on? All right. If your new tank is two months old and your ammonia is at four, there's really something wrong. Um, because even if you don't add bacteria, the ammonia should start going down after starting at eight days and by day 15, 20, your tank should pretty much be ammonia free. You may have a lot of nitrite, but the ammonia should be, be down. Um, after 60 days to still have ammonia at four, we have to look at where that ammonia is coming from. Now with this, I don't know whether the person's added 
because sometimes people say, well, my ammonia is at four. And what they've done is they're adding ammonia every day because they think the bacteria are going to starve. And let's take a little side trail. You do <laughs> not have to feed the bacteria every day. These are bacteria. They're not humans. And even a human person is not going to starve if they don't eat for one day. The bacteria do not have to be fed every day. They don't have to be fed two or three times a day. They can go weeks. Nitrifiers can go really months, a year or two without ammonia. Okay, They're a biochemical factory. They're not eating. So don't feed the ammonia every day. Uh, but let, let's assume this person just added ammonia once. So where's two things. Either the system won't support bacteria and that means there's something toxic. So did you dechlorinate the water? A lot of people don't realize that you have to take the chlorine out of the tap water. Now, if you're using an RODI system, that's done. But if this is a freshwater tank, people don't realize maybe that you have to do that. Or maybe you went the route of setting up your tank and I'm going to use the purest water available. So you went down and you filled it with DIRO water and that's all you used. Now that water's too pure. Nitrifying bacteria, in fact, few bacteria will live in RODI water. You went down to the store, it's a small tank and you bought five or 10 gallons of, uh, of uh, di distilled water and put it in there. That water's too pure. The bacteria are dead because of osmosis. They, they're not able to live. So probably you don't have a, a, a environment that is conducive to bacteria living. Probably that's the answer. The other thing that could be is that you've got this continuous ammonia source. That means there's something leaching ammonia or producing ammonia, and that could be organics. Do you have a tree stump in there? Do you have a lot of live sand or live soil with a lot of organics? Did you use a special a plant soil or some of the shrimp soils that really reduce the pH and leach ammonia? So you've got to investigate the tank. There's just something there that's not allowing bacteria to grow and is producing ammonia in the system. Uh, I would check pH. If the pH was really low, below six or even 6.5, the nitrifying bacteria are going to grow slow, really, really slow. And that means the ammonia is going to stay up. Or was the water pure? That's wrong. You got to add some minerals back to it. Or did you not dechlorinate? Those are the three things I would look at. Good to know. All right. So hopefully... Whoever wrote us in this question, hopefully you are listening and this helps you to figure out what's going on so that you can get your tank up and running and finished with its cycle. Yes. I feel like waiting for a tank to cycle is always one of the hardest parts of the hobby. Just like having the patience to wait and do it slowly. That and doing your research before you buy anything. Those are the two. Yeah, pa things. patience is... <laughs> is thin in the aquarium. Well, of course, you got a nice tank. It's in your living room, your bedroom, wherever. You want some corals, some fish, some animals in it. But patience, patience, patience. will pay off. Yep. All right. Next question. If you aerate biomedia, will it help to reduce phosphates? This is one of these. I'm, I'm not sure where you're going. So aeration itself will not reduce phosphates. But aerating biomedia, meaning having a lot of oxygen in there, what's that going to do? That is going to help the bacteria grow, not only the nitrifiers, uh, but also the heterotrophs. Now, they're not breathing. This is a question I got asked, and there was a kind of a long debate at RAP. You know, how can the bacteria live in a bottle? There's no oxygen. No bacteria have lungs. It just, they do not breathe like you and I. Uh, they, it's a biochemical reaction in order to convert NH3 ammonia into NO2. 
They need to have the oxygen molecule present. The heterotrophs, the same way, in order to convert detritus, you know, a, a, quote, dirt, and break that down, they need to have oxygen. So how can that reduce phosphate in biomedia when bacteria grow and divide and produce more bacteria, they're assimilating or they're consuming phosphate out of the water. The, every living organism needs phosphate. And, and nitrifying bacteria, heterotrophic bacteria, all these bacteria that are in the system, they need phosphate. And as they grow and divide and establish a larger number of bacteria, they're taking phosphate out of the water. So I think this is kind of one of those things. Yeah, if you if you have lots of oxygen in your biomedia in the water, then you're going to have a healthier bio filter, even nitrifiers or heterotrophs that are taking you know doing their job, and so they're removing the phosphate from the water. Right. Okay. Next question. I want to set up a five gallon tank and do a fish in cycle with your product. How much one and only do I need to add to my tank? Well, it depends on the number of fish, the size of the fish, and most, most importantly, the amount of food, the, the, mm. you know, if I say one fish, well, is that a Cardinal Tetra or is that a, you know, full blown, you know, Oscar, or something like that. The bigger the fish, the more oxygen it needs. So to be extra careful, I would say add a two ounce, a full two ounce bottle of one and only. And it takes 24 hours really for the bacteria to start really working because they want to stick to a surface. They, you pour them into the water, they settle into the substrate, the water current puts them into the biomedia. Now they need to adhere to that and start working. So while yes, you can add the bacteria and the fish in the same day, don't forget to dechlorinate the water. Um, it's best to wait a day, but to err on the side of caution, I would add a whole bottle, but at least uh, 10 mils is, you know, uh, so that's a third of an ounce. You sh should add at least that much to the tank. But again, it depends upon how big a fish and how many fish you're adding and how much food you're putting in the tank. Now, now this next question, I think is, I guess this one's probably kind of a two part. So following that last one during a fish in cycle, is it necessary to feed the fish on the first day? Can I put the fish in and add a whole bottle of one and only and then feed on day two? So that's kind of right in line with what you're talking about. Right. Yeah. It's not necessary to feed the fish on the first day, depending on where you got the fish. It may be a little, you know, stress from transportation. It may not feel like eating. Um, and so you're just polluting the, the tank anyway. So you can definitely add a whole bottle and feed on the second day. It, and start feeding lightly, especially with fish that have come from the store or been shipped. It's better to feed small amounts more frequently when they're new rather yep. than just once, uh, once a day, a large amount. Yeah. I always like to tell people like less is more feed a few pellets or a few flakes or whatever, watch your fish eats it, eat it. If it, if it looks like it's still hungry, then you can feed more, but better to do a little bit and then add versus right. too much. Yeah, definitely. I agree with that. And if you have too much, make sure you clean it out. Don't let it just sit in there. Right. It's just polluting the tank. Yeah. Just causing more problems for yourself later on. What is your opinion on UV sterilizers? If I get one, do I need to run it 24 seven? Uh, well, UV sterilizers are to me kind of like protein skimmers. They can work they can help you, but I don't like running them 24 seven unless you have a reason. And, and I pretty much would say don't have a UV sterilizer on a reef tank. You're trying to actually grow back good bacteria and a whole community of microorganisms in the water. That'll help your filtration, reduce your nitrates and phosphates. And most importantly, your corals are filter feeding, filtering that water 24 hours a day. So they're getting nutrients, bacteria and stuff out of that water. 
your UV sterilizer is going to kill all that stuff. Where a UV sterilizer would help is that if you are running a large fish only system and uh, there's you dentist out there. Yeah, you're guilty of this. It seems to be dentist doctors in their <laughs> offices. They, they have these large tanks in their waiting rooms, which is great. You're calming people down, but they just feed tons and tons of food. And the more food you feed, the more particulate material you have in the water. And that leads to the potential of having increased uh, nasty bacteria. So then a UV sterilizer can help. Also, if you've got a tank that's in an area that gets a ton of light and you can't control the light and you're feeding a lot with a lot of nutrients, you're going to have algae. So the UV sterilizer can help reduce the algae with the caveat that's in the water. The UV sterilizer, like a protein skimmer, is not going to do anything for something growing on surfaces. Mm -hmm. So you have to be careful because, yeah, you can eliminate the green algae in the water, but the nutrients are there and the light is there and nature says, fine, we'll checkmate you and grow tons of cyanos and dinos and all sorts of nasty, you know, stuff that you don't want on the surfaces. So... Yeah, nature's always going to check nature. I like that. I just imagine this like little thing popping up in my tank, like on the glass checkmate. Uh -huh. checkmate. Uh, exactly. So, all right. So, I know one of the things that we had questions about during the show was block media and how you should be positioning it in your tank. Yes. And people, oh yeah, I just threw a block in or I laid a block in and think about, you know, this is all these types of porous medias. The water is going to take the path of the least resistance and the media is going to get a biofilm on it. So just laying some media in the tank is probably not going to have much effect. If you're going to use the block media or the or other types of these media, what you need to do is stack it so the water has to pass through it. Now with the blocks, that's really easy. You just let's like laying bricks. You just lay them on top of each other and the water's got to go through it. If you've got the smaller media, consider some bags that are stacked up where the water has to go through the media. And also, as I talked about earlier, the nitro fires are sticking to stuff. And what's my, you know, kind of downside of these types of medias is that they do clog. That's just, that's just the factor. Okay. They do clog. If you work in a public aquarium or any place, aquaculture facility, you're always backwashing and cleaning your biofilter because you don't <laughs> want it to clog with, with these heterotrophic bacteria. The same thing with the media. Take it out once in a while and rinse it. And, and I know this is like sacrilegious. You can rinse it under your laundry sink or out in the yard with chlorinated water. Yes, I said that. You can use a little bit of chlorine. I'm not saying bathe it or keep it there for hours, but a quick rinse to get the detritus and the, 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 the dirt off of it and the, is going to be fine. The nitrifiers are stuck to the media. They're inside a biofilm, which is very resistant to chlorine toxicity. So just a quick rinse with chlorinated water is going to be fine. The bacteria will survive this and put it back. So stack it so the water has to go through it and keep it clean is the most efficient way of using that type of media. All right. Now, this next question, I think, is another one that we heard about. Well, we're asked at the show um, dealing with ammonia leaching, ammonium, aluminium. There we go. Aluminium. <laughs> <laughs> Aluminum. Aluminium. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, trying to come at you in, in droves or something, because I was asked several times about. Of people had their ICP tests and they had aluminum in the water, you know, and, and they were, how do I, how do I eliminate all this? Am I going to have to change the tank, the decorations? And 
it's kind of a quandary. And even some people say these, these media blocks leach aluminum, which is going to kill your fish. And, and here's an issue with that. In order for a metal, and, you know, obviously aluminum is a metal, to be toxic, it actually has to be in the ionic form. It can't be complexed or chelated. It's like copper. You know, you make copper more effective by chelating it or less effective by binding it with something. It's the dissolved copper, the free copper. So it's the free ion that's really getting into the, the fish or the coral that's killing it. And the problem with aluminum is your pH has to be lower than four, more like two, or up about 12 to have any free aluminum in the water. And if your pH is in those zones, you've got much worse problems than aluminum in the water. And I'm not even sure where aluminum could come from, except that now this, this is one area. If you're using natural seawater taken from the coast, Coastal waters tend to have elevated levels of aluminum that are comp, they're stuck to something in the water. They're not free swimming. And as I've talked about in the past with ICP tests, the ICP test can't tell you whether it was stuck on something or whether it was free in the water. Um, that's the downside of that. You know, they don't filter out the particle and aluminum is kind of like phosphate is going to stick to something. Mm -hmm. So, um, you can, you know, unless if you're using seawater from a coastal area, you should really try to filter that really well to get all the particulates out. And if you're not, that's a potential source. But th th I would not be worried at all about aluminum being harmful to anything in your tank because it's just not in the dissolved form that can be harmful in, to your tank. Mm. That's good. All right. So this, this one isn't one that one of the questions that we got at the show, one that came in on the info emails. How deep would you recommend keeping the sand bed? I'm worried about it being too deep that it will collect waste and debris. I am a shallow sand person. Um, no more than an inch, inch and a half. So, you know, three, four, five centimeter, or, uh, centimeters. Uh, if you're doing the metric, but uh, because you want to keep it clean, deep sand beds, not the traditional one with the plenum underneath, you know, the space, but just piling up the, the substrate does tend to make it easier for the substrate to go anaerobic, which, or anoxic, which you can see it'll, it'll be a black band there when you're looking through your tank. And then eventually you're going to stir that up and it's going to release, if it's anaerobic, it's going to release phosphates, which is going to trigger a bacteria or an algae bloom. If it's anoxic, it's going to release hydrogen sulfide, which is basically going to kill everything. And we had and one you're person. You're going to know. You're going to know. We had per, one person to the show. Oh yeah, I you know I finally decided to clean my tank, and boy, did it smelled like rotten eggs, and then everything died. And the problem being that hydrogen sulfide, you know that stinky rotten egg smell, is highly so, uh, soluble, and you your tank can have. 100% oxygen saturation, and your animals are still going to die because they, they basically suffocate with the large amount of hydrogen sulfide, even nitrifying bacteria. There's not much that will kill a nitrifying bacteria without breaking its cell open, but hydrogen sulfide is one of those things that will um, kill nitrifiers. And that's why, you know, this bad things only happen when you're gone, you come back from a weekend out or something and your canister filter stopped. Oof. Do not just turn it back on immediately disconnect it from the system and rinse it out because it does not take long for the system to go anoxic. What's happening is the same bacteria that we talked about earlier that are breaking down the organics. Well, they do that when there's oxygen present, but as the oxygen drops 
and it goes from high oxygen to low oxygen, that's at the anaerobic zone, they start converting nitrate to dinitrogen. They're doing denitrification, the exact same bacteria. It's not a new species or anything like that. Well, once the nitrate disappears or once they use all the oxygen in the canister system and it goes anoxic, the bacteria don't stop. They go, well, I still want to divide and there's lots of sulfate in this water. I'm going to use the sulfate and I'm going to produce hydrogen sulfide. And this, depending on the organic levels in the system, can happen quite rapidly within a couple of days, definitely. And they start taking that sulfate and producing hydrogen sulfide gas. And then you come in, jiggle the canister filter, and it all of a sudden starts and you put all that hydrogen sulfide in your tank and then disaster. So, and that can happen getting back to the sand bed. That can, that's what happens. In the sand bed where it's deeper, then it's more prone to starting to go anaerobic and that will bind phosphate. You get in there and stir it all up and oxygenate it. All that phosphate's released into the water. Phosphate's you know, a, a compound that bacteria and algae want. Now they've basically been dosed with a high level of phosphate. They start growing like crazy. Or deeper in the sand bed, the back, there's a stratification, nitrifiers at the top, taking out some oxygen, heterotrophs in the middle layers, removing more oxygen as they reduce the organics. And then it goes anoxic down below. And those bacteria kind of sit there, you know, they don't have, there's not any water flowing through it, but they're, they're doing their thing. And you can get these pockets of hydrogen sulfide. And you release that, you stir it up and release it all into the tank and your tank wipes out. So, And you're going to know real quickly if you've done that. Yeah. And actually, there's an interesting story, if I can digress again. Of course. I uh, love it, your story. <laughs> so there is this region in Africa where over millennia, you know, there's best means wipe out. These villages have just been, for no apparent reason, just everyone or a large population of the village just dies suddenly. And what they traced it to was these villages were near these very deep lakes. And what would happen over time is the organics would go down into, you know, fall down or settle down into the lakes and they would start generating hydrogen sulfide. But because the lake was stratified, this hydrogen sulfide bubble would, would just stay down there and build and build. But then at some point, the bubble would, would burst and it would come up to the surface. Hydrogen sulfide being more denser than air would stay along the surface and it was suffocating everybody. Oh my God. This is, this is not, this, I'm not making this up. And so the solution was that they basically put a big giant straw in the lake. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm not kidding. And so they had this pipe that would go down and it would basically off gas. Once the bubble started getting so big, it would hit the, you know, the straw and it, and it would, come up to the surface in a more controllable, controllable manner, rather than releasing these big, you know, bubbles of hydrogen sulfide that would kill everyone that was living around the lake. Oh, wow. Yeah. Now you All right. I'm gonna have to go <laughs> look that up. And sounds yeah. like maybe I might do a post on that. Okay. But yeah, it's pretty interesting. Fascinating. So. See, your stories are always awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Limnology, folks. Yeah. Oh, and now what's limnology? Study of freshwater biology. It's kind of like marine biology, but limnos from the Greek word for marshes. And yes, I went to the Limnology Institute, University of Uppsala, my junior year in college. That's in Uppsala, Sweden. And the classes were in Swedish, which was quite fun. So we could do like a whole podcast in a different language? <laughs> Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Be one-sided. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. Um, the one thing I wanted to add to that question about sand bed depth, um, keep in mind it, what type of fish you have. 
Um, I know there are some species of fish that do like a deeper sand bed. So if you have some of those fish, maybe you would want it a little bit deeper, but make sure you've got a sand sifting cleanup crew that can help move some of that stuff around and help to reduce any accumulation of debris. Yeah, that's good. That That's a good point. Hillary. Yes. Depending on the fish you're keeping, you may want it a little deeper, but like you said, get some sand sifters in there. Uh, yeah. There's lots of stuff living in the upper layers of uh, the seafloor. Yes. Yeah. Tons of stuff. <laughs> yeah. Tons of interesting stuff. Oh yeah. I really love to sidetrack. Um, <laughs> Umbari, the Monterey Bay Research Institute, they have a fascinating uh, Instagram page. I always love like all of the cool stuff that they have, like deep sea creatures that you've never even been able to dream up some of these things that they post and share about. So, yeah. And they've got their live camera on too. So you can always check out what they're doing. And yeah, great what? place. Yeah. Yes. All right. I've got one last question that was on my list, but if we have any other questions from the show, we can go over those after this one. Um, if I'm using one and only with live rock and live sand, how should I cycle the tank? Is there anything you recommend or things that I should be aware of when using this combination? Yeah, I, this is a this this is a great question to end this uh, our podcast, and then we'll have to continue. And yes. What you should do, so why is there a caveat here? Live rock, live sand contains organics. They've been shipped. They've been in the shipping bag, the shipping box and things like that. Some of that stuff's going to die. As it, as it dies, even if you rinse it really well, and you can't rinse it super you know, hard with a pressure washer or anything you want it live you want all these encrusting microorganisms and stuff but some of that stuff is going to die it's going to be decayed and it decays into ammonia the heterotrophic bacteria take organic material and they degrade it into co2 so the organic carbon is degraded into co2 and the uh, nitrate the nitrogen stuff is re is degraded into ammonia and they also release phosphate. It's how it's the cycle of life. It's why we are not covered in waste and because bacteria and microorganisms are recycling like a compost pile. They're recycling all this. So you put all this in the water, you're adding oxygen, the bacteria are degrading this and there could already be ammonia. Chances are there will be ammonia in the water. So you want to let this cycle for at least 24 to 48 hours and then measure ammonia. And if there's ammonia present, then don't add ammonia drops. Add the one and only bacteria for sure. Um, but then don't add the artifact, you know, the ammonium chloride because you've got plenty of ammonia in the system. And as I've said many times, more ammonia is not better. Just yep. uh, keep, you know, small frequent doses of ammonia is much better waiting a day or two between ammonia dosings. I mean, people get kind of confused on our recipe card because it says, well, day three, I'm supposed to add ammonia. Well, you didn't read down further where it says if the ammonia levels are above, you know, two or three, skip because your bacteria are not going to starve. And so skip that addition. So that's what you need to do is, is measure the ammonia. If there's ammonia, don't add. Also, what you might consider, you know, you got some live rock from a friend, you know, who's tearing down their tank and the tank is cloudy and it's kind of a mess. Maybe you want to bite the bullet and, and get all this organic material out of the system by adding something like our waste away bacteria to really degrade all that dead material. So basically you add the waste away, lots of water movement and aeration before you start cycling the tank. Cause you're not going to want to put fish in a tank that's, that's full of uh, bacteria degrading organics because the bacteria are consuming huge amounts of, of oxygen from the water. So basically it's kind of like 
adding a, or doing a backfire where you're taking care of the fuel so that the fire burns itself out. The same thing here, add a little waste away bacteria to just degrade those organics, get the skimmer going to remove all this material, clean up the system, and then start your cycle. Good to know. Good advice. Yeah. So, good advice for a good question. <laughs> yeah, that was a good question because more and more people use that, and I understand that. But we're trying to, you know, reduce, keep the ammonia at a manageable level. Cycling, people say, well, I have eight, you know, 16 uh, parts per million ammonia. It's like, how did you get that high? Well, as I've said a dozen times, well, I thought the bacteria were starving. I had to add it, or I added a bunch of live rock and live sand, and the ammonia drops. So you need your test kits. Your test kits help you navigate the cycling. And uh, it, it doesn't have to be frustrating if you just um, follow the directions about not letting the ammonia get too high. Good call. So. All right, Haley. I think it's been great. We got a lot more questions, but always people can send more to you, to me, to... Uh, info site to our social media site. So, yep. yep. We are happy to answer any of your questions as we get them and then, you know, answer them on here so that if anybody else has the same questions or concerns, hopefully they'll be able to learn from your questions as well. So don't hesitate to send them in. Right. And as always, they're anonymous. We never leave names with these. So don't be worried. Yeah. Don't, don't be shy because uh, if, if you've got that question, Probably a lot of other people have it. Probably we've done whatever your question is. So learn from our experience because <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> we're not going to go into those horror stories, are we? No. Yeah. Not, not this one, but maybe for a future episode. <laughs> yeah, that's it. <laughs> Hillary and Dr. Tim. Lessons learned the hard lessons, way. Yeah, lessons learned <laughs> the hard way. Well, when you run a fish hatchery, you learn a lot of lessons the hard way. So. Oh, yeah. Yep. All right, everyone. Thank you very much again, Hillary. It's been wonderful. And um, we'll do another podcast, maybe maybe next week or something we'll do. Yeah. We'll pop one in here quicker and get, get uh, answer some of these other questions. So. Yep. Sounds like a plan. All right. Thanks, everyone. And good fish keeping.